Hello, my name is Brenda Miller, and I'm welcoming you to the College Heights Baptist Church weekly service and inviting you to this call to worship. This call to worship is something we do corporately and with other believers in our community and across the world, including the Holy Land Israel. Today's call to worship scripture is from the book of Psalm, chapter 68, verses 34 to 35. Tell everyone about God's power. His majesty shines down on Israel. His strength is mighty in the heavens. God is awesome in his sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Scripture directs us to bless the Lord our God at all times. I invite you to worship him with gladness and come to him in joyful song. Well, thank you, Brenda, for such a great call to worship. And happy Canada Day, or happy Canada Day weekend, depending on when you're watching this. Um, since it's Canada Day uh, weekend, I thought I'd start our service off just by uh, having a time of prayer for our country and, and for our church. Uh, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the freedom and the provision and uh, all of these resources uh, of our land. We thank you for all the blessings that we experience and so often take for granted in this amazing country of Canada. We're so thankful to be able to call this place our home. What a blessing that is to us, God. And yet, Lord, we want to acknowledge that, that we also know that we are far from perfect. Our nation is, is deeply in need of healing, and not just uh, in terms of COVID and, and grief, but uh, as we wrestle with our past as a country and ponder how to move forward together. God, we pray for those who have experienced such devastation in connection with the residential schools. This is uh, just such a heartbreaking tragedy, and we are grieved by this, God. Uh, we just desperately need wisdom, wisdom from you. So uh, would you give us all much wisdom and humility and compassion and grace, God, especially those in leadership in our country? It's so hard to know how things can be made right, and we need you to lead us in this because we know that apart from you, uh, these things can, cannot be reconciled. I pray that there would be uh, repentance and forgiveness and justice, whatever that looks like. Help us as your church as well to know how to serve you in this time, Lord. I also pray for those who are struggling uh, in our church, uh, either with grief or with sickness or uh, with troubles of, of many kinds. Uh, be close to them, I pray. And ask, just ask that you would bring them comfort and, and strength, God. Your word tells us so clearly uh, that you are near to the brokenhearted. So I pray, God, that they would experience uh, that. And I thank you for that promise. We also thank you for the great news that we're able to move back to full capacity worship services as of this weekend. And that we can also sing together again. I know that that's something that so many of us have been uh, really longing for, God. I know that, that it's such a blessing to my heart to see these restrictions lift. And I know that it will be uh, for so many in our church as well as the other churches across our city and across our province. So, uh, God... We thank you. Um, as for today, I pray that you'd be glorified in our midst, uh, wherever we are, uh, either in the room or, or watching this from home. And I ask that you would be at work in our hearts, God. We desperately need your work in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Breaks the power of sin and darkness. The love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of Glory, the King of all kings. Breaks the power of sin and darkness.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again to College Heights Baptist Church. Today, we are going to wrap up the sermon series we've been in, in those first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Uh, we've been wrestling with the story that gives meaning and understanding to our own stories. Uh, where we left off two weeks ago was the account of the flood. Uh, you may remember God removed the barriers, returned the world to the stage that we had first met it in Genesis chapter 1. Those opening verses described the earth as um, being covered uh, by water. And so God began again. And then in Genesis chapter 10, uh, if you quickly look down there, you'll see the, the stage is set for the rest of the biblical story. The nations are introduced that came from the descendants of Noah. And that brings us to chapter 11, our final passage in this series. And here's what I want to do with this message. Uh, I do want to keep it simple. Uh, I'm going to read the first nine verses for us, and then I want to observe some things in them. And I want to do it in the way I did, I think it was a few weeks ago, where I just pointed out single words that we can reflect on. So I, today I've got five words, and I'm going to move through them even quicker than I did a few weeks ago. Uh, we'll look at those five words, then we'll bring this series to a close by doing a little reflection as we uh, prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. So how about I start by reading uh, our passage for us. Again, I'm in Genesis 11, and we're just going to focus in on the first nine verses there. It says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the whole face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that they were building. And he said, If as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. I, th I think if I could pause there, the language might better be, um, they'll stop at nothing. Uh, so verse 7, come, let us go down, confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. That's our reading for today. And as I said, I want to look at five uh, different words very quickly. First word is east. And you're going to notice that a lot of the words I'm pointing out are seemingly inconsequential. But when we dig a little deeper, they're telling us something important about this story and eventually our story too. East, verse 2, people moved eastward. Now, I want to point out this isn't just about geography, because we keep seeing this word east in the opening chapters of the Bible. Uh, and every time it occurs, it's telling us that humanity is moving further and further and further away from God. Uh, when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, which direction did they go? East. Uh, when Cain killed his brother Abel and left the presence of God, where did he go? East. Now here again, we find the world's population continuing to move, or to move further east. Okay, that word is pointing to separation. It's reminding us about this gap between humanity and their creator that's ever, ever widening. East, first word. Second word, brick. You know, as you read verse 3 and you see it below me on the screen, uh, why... Out of all the things that could be told about the story, does the author of Genesis, inspired by the Holy Spirit, go into the detail about building materials? And this is actually one of the favorite uh, observations I learned this week in my own study. Uh, Israel, when uh, Israel built her homes, their homes, they used stone and they used mortar. And our verse says specifically that um, in Babel they didn't. What did they use? They used brick, and they said, let's bake it thoroughly. We might imagine an Israelite saying to them, you better bake it thoroughly because it's not going to hold. 
Bible scholars point out that this little detail, seemingly inconsequential to us, is actually telling us that this building project, though grand and extremely impressive to the human eye, was built on shaky foundation. Babel was built with uh, material that was inherently weak. Bricks would not stand the test of time and all the adversity that would come. Babel would crumble. It would fall because it wasn't built on rock. Brick, that's our second word. Third word, heavens. Verse four, it says, they said, come, uh, let's build ourselves a city that, with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Um, I, I was gonna put a picture up but ran out of time in my prep here of uh, some of the buildings archeologists have discovered for us and been able to explore, but built by ancient civilizations like Babylon. If I, if I dare pronounce it, it's a, a ziggurat or something closely resembling that pronunciation. But you've probably seen them in National Geographic or on TV shows or Indiana Jones. But what all of these structures have in common is this staircase that begins at ground level and climbs and climbs and climbs towards the skies. And the thinking here is the people wanted to travel to the gods. And if the gods liked to do so, they could use the staircase to come down to earth. But the attempt here was to close the gap between heaven and earth by elevating humanity. And so I want you to understand this building story is not about architecture. It's not about engineering. God is not against humans um, collaborating or humans uh, using their God-given creativity to build cities and buildings and towers. That's not the takeaway here. All of those things would have become necessary even in the Garden of Eden as time advanced. This is about pride. This is about arrogance. They wanted a new society apart from God. They wanted to break into the heavens on their own. Heavens. And my fourth word, name. They wanted to do this so they could make a name for themselves. And if you're like me, I, I approach this text thinking that was simply about reputation or fame. Uh, but it was pointed out in the commentaries I read that in the Bible, the exercise of naming is usually about having dominion over what is being named. So think about it this way. God named the humans. Adam didn't name himself, but God gave Adam the privilege of being able to name all of the other animals that he would have dominion over. And this story then is about the desire humanity has to rule for ourselves however we choose apart from God. One writer says that these people of Babel were tired of being named. They wanted to do the naming for themselves. They were declaring their independence from the God who names us all. They wanted to cast off his rule, find meaning and purpose, significance, even power apart from him. That's why if you look down again at the verse, there's one word repeated twice, ourselves. Let us build for ourselves a city. Let us build for ourselves a name. Again, it's all apart from God. And here's the fifth word then. And the fifth word is Babel. We find it there, I think it's verse 9. It says this is why it's called Babel, because they're the Lord confused the language of the whole world. Uh, interestingly, though, that word or that name Babel uh, originally meant uh, gate of the gods. In their eyes, their city with its glorious staircase was the center of the universe. But in the eyes of the God who created the universe, inspecting their city with its impressive tower, all he saw was a place of confusion. And from this point on in the Bible, we see that truth play out again and again. Humanity continues eastward. But all the while, even though Babel, the physical place, was left behind, the spirit and the independence of Babel went with them. And physically, as we make our way through the Old Testament, we come to the nation of Babylon, who would be a great enemy of God's people. God's people would be exiled in this strange land for 70 years, as you may recall. 
But metaphorically, that term Babel or Babylon would be used throughout the Bible to speak of a great system of godlessness that led people astray from him. It became a code word of sorts for life apart from God here on earth below. Babylon. I'll give you one example. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. The early Christians used it as a code name for Rome. The early Christians were all in on this language. The apostle Peter writing to them says, She who is in Babylon, Rome, the system opposed to God, chosen together with you, send her greetings. She who is in Babylon. Well, Babylon had long since passed. But the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of Babel, lived on and the Christians were taught to recognize it. Peter picks up this theme here in this verse and he's recognizing that just like the exiled Hebrew people of old spending that 70 years in those strange lands of Babylon, Christians here on earth are tempted to compromise. We're seduced by worldly things. It's possible for us just like all the nations of this earth, to become intoxicated, deceived, and seduced by the false system the Bible speaks about that's headed by Satan. And that's why it was so very, very difficult for people to follow Jesus in Peter's day. It's why it's very, very difficult for you and I in this world to follow Jesus. It's because we live in Babylon. The spirit of Babel is very much alive, and we see it also in the book of Revelation. Uh, some churches, you, you go to the early chapters of Revelation, we read of seven churches receiving seven letters from Jesus. Some churches were holding up really well in Babylon. Others were completely collapsing under the persecution and the pressure that was upon them. But when you fast forward through the book of Revelation and you get towards the end, chapters 18 and 19, there's this promise given to the church about Babylon. And the promise is that it will fall. In fact, even as I preach the sermon, the voice from the throne says Babylon is falling, 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 falling even now. The city of man, the city apart from God, the systems, the ideologies that oppose him and persecute his people are falling, falling, falling. And not just falling deeper into confusion, but falling ultimately to their own ruin because at the end of the story Babylon does fall and all who oppose God all who um, oppose his people all who seek to live their lives independently of him in the end of the story are given exactly what they've wanted all along which is eternity apart from God complete separation from the goodness and the grace of his rule and his reign the full consequences of his entire absence. Falling, falling, falling. But that's not where the story ends because as Babylon falls, when you get to Revelation 20 and 21, we read that another city emerges. A kingdom that Jesus has been teaching us to pray for. A kingdom, Jesus said, is already coming, 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 even as Babylon is falling, falling, falling. But a kingdom that one day will come in full, a new heaven and a new earth. The close of our Bibles, we read about a city of God, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven above. And so the story of the Bible is that there's two cities, there's two kingdoms, there's essentially two kinds of people and there's two destinies. And the appeal of the Bible beginning to end is that we, the reader, would consider over and over again, which city are we living for? To which kingdom do we belong? Who, in fact, is king? And the Bible pleads with us. Think of Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't conform to Babylon. Don't conform to Babel. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
the will that we're supposed to be praying would be done here on earth in Babylon, even as it is in heaven. We don't oppose God like Babylon. We submit to his rule and to his reign. We don't worship the gods of Babylon. We bow the knee only to Yahweh, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whereas Revelation describes Babylon as having sins piled to the heavens, and that's kind of a fun statement when you think about how they built stairs to the heavens. God, inspecting it all, says the only thing that reached the heavens in Babylon is its sin. But for us as the people of God belonging to the coming kingdom and under the reign of Jesus Christ, we don't pile up our sins. We cast them to the cross. They're covered in the blood of Jesus and they're dealt with. We are forgiven. And so we are repenters, turning away from all that Babylon prides itself in. And while Babylon pursues earthly treasures and material things, we, belonging to the king enthroned above, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We turn away from selfishness to serve God and others. We turn away from injustice here below to live in ways that are righteous doing what is just and pleasing to God, even at personal cost. And through it all, even as we're exiled here on Babylon below, awaiting the city to come, we love and we will be known for our love, even in the face of whatever persecution comes our way. And on top of all of that here in Babylon, we listen to the voice from the throne that said in Revelation 18 verse 4, come out of her. Come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of Babylon, my church. Don't share in her sins. You might say back, how do we come out of Babylon? I think the words of Jesus are helpful here. On the eve of his crucifixion, he prayed to the Father for his disciples, including us. He said, John 17, 15 to 18, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. Did you catch that? The day will come where we leave Babylon, where we make our way to the city of God. But for now, we're in the world, but never of the world. Radically different language there. Not in, but of Maybe again you'd say, okay, but how do I come out of Babylon? And I think it's by understanding each and every day we get to live our lives in Christ. We get to abide in Christ. We get to make him our refuge. We're a branch connected to him, the vine. We're the sheep to his shepherd. Each and every day of our lives, he leads us through Babylon. He sustains us towards the greater city to come. That night in the upper room, as he was leaving, Jesus was calling us to himself, to fellowship and friendship with himself, ensuring to us that the Holy Spirit would come, making us, transforming us, quickening us, so that we could be salt, that we could be light, that we could bear his witness, even in Babylon when it's hard to sing our song. And even here in Babylon, be able to point others towards the peace and the hope and the forgiveness and the purpose and the joy that we ourselves have found in Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Uh, in his book, Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis paints a cool picture. I, I think so anyways. He says this, he says, we are half-hearted creatures we're fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who goes on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are too easily pleased. 
I remind you in this message as we approach the Lord's Supper, Babylon offers mud pies in the slum. The new Jerusalem, go to the end of your Bible, offers an eternity of blessing beyond imagination. Do not be too easily pleased. Don't be seduced by a world that cannot deliver on its promises. For you were not made for Babylon. You were made by God and for God and for his coming city. And your heart will remain restless until it finds its rest in him. And so as we bring this sermon series to a close and as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, let us return very quickly to those five words I walked you through a moment ago. We looked at those five words and we applied them to Babylon. Now I want to take the same five words as we come to the table and apply them to ourselves. First word, east. I ask, what's your trajectory? Uh, Where are you headed? Is your life moving towards the God who made you in his image and for himself? Or are you still pushing forward on your own, ever eastward, trying to make it apart from him? Uh, David Atkinson in his commentary on these verses says, if you live without God as your center, you will have no center at all. This table invites each one of us to quit wandering. Come home. The bread reminds us Jesus alone can sustain and fill us. Only he can take away our hunger. The cup reminds us his blood was shed for our forgiveness. His blood covers all of our eastwardness, all of our wanderings. Second word, brick. What are you building your life upon? It's hard not to think of the story that Jesus closed the Sermon on the Mount with, right? Two builders, one on sand, one on the rock. Storm comes, we know what happened. The lesson Jesus wanted us to learn is that we, his followers, have to build our lives on his word. He even says, do not just listen to it. Do not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Every day here in Babylon, putting it into practice, building upon the rock that is the foundation of our lives. James 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to God's word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And I think this is something for each of us to wrestle, wrestle with. Are we building on a foundation that can weather Babylon with all of its storms? Are we building with brick, with clay, with sand, none of which is eternal? Heavens was my third word. I want to say we can't make it to the heavens in our own wisdom, efforts, good works, and accomplishments. We can't make it to the heavens in our own righteousness. There is no staircase that we can build to bridge the gap except to fall upon the grace of God and accept the one he's already provided. While humanity has been spending our time trying to earn and build our way to the heavens, God has done the opposite. The table set before us with the bread and the cup reminds us that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, left the heavens to come all the way down to us to build a bridge for us, to build a staircase, if you will, for us to himself. He's made a way, he became the way, and he did so at the cost of his life. None of us come to this table because we're good enough. If you come to the table thinking you're better than the other people who come, you do not understand the table. While we were all sinners, Christ died for us. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works. This is a gift of God. None of us get to boast before him. 
we come to this table not in our goodness, but we come by faith trusting that Jesus is good enough for us. Jesus has made way to the heavens for us. We come to this table confessing, as Paul said in Romans chapter 10, that Jesus is Lord, even here in Babylon. That if we believe in our hearts that he has been raised from the dead, that he has ascended back to the heavens, will be saved, will never be put to shame, and even as Babylon falls, falls, falls all around us, we will stand in the city of God, faultless, blameless, with great joy. My fourth word, name. When we confess at this table Jesus is Lord, we're reminded we no longer live for our own names, our own reputations, our own fame. We lay those aside. Romans 12, verse 1, we offer ourselves every day as a living sacrifice to God. And every day, we are the people here in Babylon who pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we get to our name, our needs. We trust them. Then we get to our need for grace and forgiveness. We accept it. Then we get to our need for protection and guidance and deliverance. We receive it. All the while knowing that to him be the glory, the honor, and the power forevermore. Our final word, Babel. As we pray that Lord's Prayer day after day, it can't be lip service. We have to also live it out. Again, hearers and doers. We have to keep on leaving Babylon, the city of confusion. We turn away from its idols, from its selfishness, its greed, its hatred, its injustice, and its evil. It's not who we are anymore. We remember each day it's falling, falling, falling. But the one who does the will of the Lord will endure forever. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this journey we've been on together as a family uh, through these 11 chapters. It feels, in my mind, we've gone way too fast. But nonetheless, I pray that on this side of the journey, we could look back and remember these things that you've taught us. I'm glad that we can end it here with this word. Lord, we confess as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper that Jesus, you are Lord. We believe in our hearts that you've been raised from the dead, ascended to the heavens, one day to return and establish a new heaven and a new earth to bring to us the new Jerusalem, the city of God. And a day will come where Babylon and all that is of it will fall, fall, fall. There will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more shame, no more pride. No more self-righteousness. And Lord, we confess afresh at this table that we want to follow you through this life. That you are the good shepherd. That you are the vine and we are the branch. That apart from you, we can bear no fruit. Lord, we pray that you would help us to humbly live for your name. That we would build our lives on the rock, on the words of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would give us the courage and the wisdom to leave Babel. Lord, each day to see where our lives are conforming to the world instead of being transformed by you. And then by the power of your Holy Spirit to make the choices that we need to make. We thank you as we prepare again to take this uh, simple meal set before us. We thank you, Jesus, that you have come down, all the way down, taking the nature of a servant, being obedient even unto death so that we could be raised to new life, that we could be lifted up to the heavens and with you forever. And so as we come to this table, we celebrate your name, 
We thank you for this gift. And we confess we come not in our own righteousness, not in our own good works, not in our titles or reputations and our fame, but we come only by your grace through faith. So receive our worship, we pray, um, for your glory. Amen. Thanks, Carl. Uh, the appropriate song. Uh, before we take the bread and the cup together, I'll give you this last reminder that we're about to do so. So you might want to pause the video if you don't have your supplies with you at home. Uh, yeah, hit pause and come back and join me. And for the rest of you, um, I've said quite a bit as far as introduction at the end of my sermon for the Lord's Supper. So I think what I want to do here at the table is just let the words of Christ speak, uh, obviously for himself. Uh, there's nothing more I can add than what he's already said. Uh, we pick up the account in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 26. It says, while they're eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. He offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We thank you, our Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to rescue, to save, to redeem, to restore. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for indwelling us, making us more um, in the image, uh, the likeness of Jesus, for leading and empowering us through life. And we pray as we go from this table and kind of re-enter Babylon, so to speak, we ask God that you would help us to do so um, with your character, with your priorities, and for sure with your love. Having just remembered the great and sacrificial love of Jesus for us, we pray that you would help us to love that same way, our neighbors, even as we love ourselves. That the way we love one another would point people to the kingdom that we belong to, but most of all, the greatness of the King who we belong to. Uh, and we pray that in the way that we live our lives, you would receive glory and honor and power, uh, all of these things which are yours forevermore. Amen. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. Lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you.
shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees My hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet Send through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. When I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. Send through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Hey everyone, me again. Uh, just before we close, we are going to hear a quick and enthusiastic update from Robin Devernwood regarding the Well Water Project. We are here praising the Lord together with you. Okay, everybody, donations are at $22,432.25. Add the seed money from the mission's budget of $1,250, and we are at a total of $23,000. $682.25. That is $1,817.75 away from three wells. Look at this. Two wells. And look how close we are to this one. It is so exciting and encouraging to see the enthusiasm and support for the Cycle for Water project. What a difference these wells will make in the lives of villagers in Africa. Let's, Let's fill, fill up, up that third well. well. All right, thank you, Woods, for that announcement. That's very exciting. Um, now, I also want to encourage you to go to our church website for information regarding our triennial uh, conference watch parties that we're going to be having on July 9th and 10th. We're going to be streaming three main sessions, and uh, we're inviting anybody that wants to come to uh, join us and we'll watch them together. So sign up for that on our church website and uh, go to our church website as well for all sorts of other information. We try to keep that uh, the place where you can learn uh, everything you need to know about our church. Um, now just as we close, uh, I just wanna read a passage. Um, Curtis was talking about uh, two cities. Um, I wanna read from Revelation chapter 21 and just think about which city we wanna be part of. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What a beautiful thought. And we look forward to that. That's our hope. All right, you guys, have a great uh, week. We'll see you again.